logical component will be the DHCP service. This is going to give us IP address information to all our home devices, whether that's an Android device, iPad, Nexus 7, Android, a tablet, or a laptop, or a desktop computer. Devices in your local area network need IP information, TCP IP information. They need to know how to find the DNS server. They need to have a unique IP address. They're going to need a subnet mask. So all of this very important networking information has to be delivered to all the devices. And that is the function of your DHCP server. This is as best I can do showing you its position in your logical components. Your DHCP server is actually connected to your switch and that's all inside that little plastic box that you pay $90 for. That is a part of the Linux services that are being provided by, by the embedded Linux operating system. Keep in mind the diagrams that I'm showing you are helping you as a student to better understand how each of these logical components relate to each other. So here is the firmware page that shows my DHCP server services that are being provided by the Embedded Linux operating system. And you can see we're going to start leasing IP addresses from 192.168.1.1. 100 and notice it's changeable you could change that to dot two cannot give 192.168.1.1 that's always assigned to your router on the LAN side so you can uh, hear that you can control how many IP addresses are leased remember because we're using private IP addresses 192.168 is a private IP address scope and it basically is a class C private IP address you could lease uh, to your home approximately 254 IP addresses. You can also if you want to use a different DNS server on the internet you can you could use Google's DNS server and then give that information out to all your home devices. So this is where you would configure your DHCP server. So here's our fifth logical component and it's called the NAT, the Network Address Translation Service. This allows all your home PCs, laptops, Android phones, tablets to use one IP. You get one IP from your ISP that is internet capable. The NAT allows you all at home to use private IP addresses and subnet masks and gateway information. And it does the magic of allowing all of your home devices to go out and surf the internet using the one IP address from your ISP. I'm not going to go into explaining that, but you can go to Wikipedia and look a little bit at it. You will need to understand that more as you get into Network Plus. So we use NAT for many reasons. One, it allows us to public IP address sharing. We can use one IP address from our ISP and all our home devices can use it. It's transparent to end users. It actually improves security. It, scale, it allows your local area network to scale and expand. And it's just a great way. It's a great service and it allows the use of IP4 very, very efficiently. Now there are some negatives to NAT. Certain applications do not like to play with network address translation. It also, because we're asking the router to do all this magic behind the scenes, it actually produces an increased load on your router, and so it can impact performance. The sixth logical component is the actual switch. This is an Ethernet switch that's provided by your multifunction device. This portion of your typical home router is called the Ethernet switch. We'll get into this in great detail in Chapter 3 in your Network Plus course. But this provides, uh, allows users to plug in and connect up to your home network. Although today we're moving more and more to everyone connecting via wireless, it's still very handy to add large PC or something that needs high speed internet connection. Our seventh logical component is the WAP, the wireless access point, okay? So this is a separate logical component. We need to understand this. Wireless functionality in a today's home is critical today with tablets and note 
uh, notebooks and uh, laptops, Android phones, iPhones. Today we're, we're primarily connecting to our home network via wireless. All of you need to start gaining understanding of the various 802.11 standards, especially G, N, and today's AC. The standard AC is still in draft. It will be a couple years before it becomes a standard, but it is definitely, we're already seeing productive, production type uh, WAPs, wireless access points, being designed around the draft standards. First of all, we're using the 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz frequency spectrum. We'll go into this in more detail in Network Plus. 802.11G can support a link speed of about 54 megabits per second. Remember, the actual thoroughput, what you actually get to transmit across the, wire, the, the wireless, is actually divided by two. So whenever you look at link speed, remember your thoroughput is almost uh, half of what you see. In 802.11N access points, or WAPs, they can support between 150 and 300 megabits per second. So again, divide that by two, and that kind of gives you an idea of what your real transfer rate will be. The new 802.11AC standard is still in draft, but it supports between 433 megabits per second and 1.69 gigabits per second. This is very exciting. We definitely want to use AC where possible. The 802.11AC standard is one of the most exciting changes or improvements that we've seen in a long time in wireless. With 802.11ac, we can have tremendous speed and capacity using one access point, one WAP. So our multifunction device with 802.11ac can handle, uh, for example, Aruba's new uh, production device that supports 802.11ac can support over 80 apps per device through their one access point. So this allows more capacity, more speed, per each and every WAP. To provide security for a home network, our wireless access points use an authentication process. We typically know them as WEP, which is very weak and is not uh, encouraged to use. We have WPA, we have WPA2. This is the best one when you can always try to use WPA, WPA2 as your wireless authentication. These authentication and encryption protocols are very complex. I'm not going to even begin to go into any of them. Just understand which one are weak, which one are the best, which uh, of the standards are the best. The access point and the client, that means your Android phone, your tablet, your laptop, both must know the passcode that is shared between the two. This allows you to authenticate. Always make this passcode complex and long with many characters. Once the authentication is complete, all wireless traffic is encrypted between the access point and the client. So this is an important concept to understand. So how are you doing? Do you confidently understand these different components? Can you identify them? Could you configure and troubleshoot a home network? Well, you may be a four. Well, we have a bunch of labs that we're going to do to help make sure that you get to a three or a four. If you're a two or a one, make sure you talk with your instructor and let him give you a hand and make sure he clarifies some things. In this presentation, we by no means covered everything. There are additional logical components and physical components in a home network. But those are the big ones that I want you to understand at this point. As we move along in our studies, we're going to learn that there are additional logical components and functionality, such as an embedded web server. There's also a Linux file server. There's going to be a Samba service that will provide Windows Server services. Many, many of these multifunction devices provide FTP services and media ser streaming services. So there's an amazing amount of functionality logical components, physical components in these boxes that you're spending $120 on. As we learn of business networks, a lot of this logical components and functionality is broken apart from a single box into individual physical components. 
And that's where we'll begin to understand our 